at, at MC today. So thank you, Megan. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Absolutely. And our first guest is Donna Miller. She's the CEO and co-founder of Purse Power uh, in Edmond, Oklahoma. And, and Donna has a lot of uh, female investors in her company, too. So perhaps we can talk some gender issues and how it pertains to this space. Donna? Perfect. Thank you very much. All right. So I've got a presentation I'm going to try to bring up here. And uh, could I please have access to screen sharing? Yeah, one moment. Okay, thank you. We're getting that. Yeah, very good. So, so while that's coming up, um, so I do own and run Purse Power, and we're working to help women use their massive purchasing power to drive positive change. Women make 80% of all purchasing decisions. The idea is that if women collectively would choose to buy from the companies that actively promote women, um, companies that are women-owned or women-led, and if we could create a funding stream for battered women shelters in the process, we could shatter glass ceilings and change lives. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. We are an Oklahoma-based company, and as you'll see in a minute, most of my investors are females. I have one male investor. His name's John Davis. Do you guys know John? No. No? Okay. He's here in Oklahoma City. Okay, I still can't get on yet. All right. Give me just a second, and we'll get started. So uh, yeah, John just recently joined us. Um, it, we've been, uh, I'll give you the backstory. So uh, you understand that there was this huge march in 17. And by the way, I'm apolitical, uh, not I'm a dead center on the political spectrum. But um, when my sisters and I were talking about the lack of women in senior leadership positions, we came to this blinding realization that women had a ton of power that they weren't using. So when I saw the march in Washington, D.C., I said, OK, they there they are. Those, those are the women that are going to care about what we're doing. So I took 30,000 buttons to the march that said, purse power, we have it, let's use it. And within minutes of setting up a table, I had six volunteers show up out of nowhere, and we gave away 30,000 buttons in three hours. And those buttons are now all over the world. So I've got a husband and two sons. I love men, love working with men. But what I'm trying to do is just help women use their purchasing power to drive change. So let me go ahead and try to see if I can do it now. So I still can't. Do you want to make me the host? Yeah. So yeah, what we're going to do is we're going to make you the host. That way you can just, um, you can share your screen. Okay. Perfect. There you go. It Thank should, you. It should have just switched over. Thank you. Perfect. I appreciate it. So um, I was under the impression that it might help you guys to talk a little bit about uh, women and investing and the interest in, in investing in women. So let me just begin here. Um, you probably know this, but women control 50% over 50% of all personal wealth in the United States today, and are, they're projected to hold 70% of the wealth in this country for the next two generations. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm a baby boomer, and we tend to live longer. Women tend to live longer. So that wealth, when the baby boomer males die off, is going to go over to women, and they are going to hold 70% of the, the wealth for the next two generations. Um, in addition to that, 40% of the breadwinners in the U.S. are now women, are led by women. Um, and women also own 40% of the businesses in the U.S. Um, even though women now hold the majority of management, professional, and related positions, they only hold 6.4% of the S&P uh, um, 500 CEO jobs and about 22% of the board seats. So again, this is one of the things that we were trying to do when we created Purse Power was to enable people to use their purchasing power, male allies too, to support the companies that actively support women. Um, women are also um, getting educated right now and are uh, getting the majority of all degrees. This is a really important point. So if you have a company of any kind, understanding that women, no matter what we make in pay, make 73 to 85% of all purchasing decisions, it's really important for people to understand that the consumers are women. The ones buying your products and services are, in the majority, women. Like Warren Buffett says, there's no telling how far we can go when we tap into the collective potential of the entire population. So just the business case for this, forget male and female, right thing to do. I don't care about that at the moment. When companies have 30% leadership, female leadership, their profit margins are higher. It shows that when you have an increase in women in top management from zero to 30%, your profitability increases by 15%. Companies in the top quartile are 15% more likely to have financial returns above the industry average. And companies with three female directors have a 42% higher return on sales and 53% higher return on equity. So not just because it's a good thing to do, the companies with the highest percentage of women have the greatest return on invested capital. 
So it's just, just a good idea to support the companies that have women in leadership. And if you own companies to try to get more women in leadership, you theoretically should get more returns out of those companies. Now there's some frustration here. If you think about it, women own 40% of the companies in the United States, but they get 2.7% of the VC investment. So there's this gigantic gap between the women business ownership and the investment that they're getting, particularly from VCs. What ends up happening, and this is by both male and female VCs, by the way, is when they're asking questions of the founders, the male-oriented question, I mean, the questions to the males tend to be about opportunities. The questions aimed at women tend to be about risk. So there's an unconscious bias. What they did is they actually taped VCs talking about female and male founders, and they used some kind of AI to actually analyze the language that was being used, and this is what was happening. And it's very interesting, they've taken, they've taken um, business plans and they've changed the name from Henry to Harriet. And three times out of four, they will pick the business plan, same business plan that's got the male name on it. So there's, there's an unconscious bias out there and male, and male and women, men and women both have that bias. I'm not saying that women don't, we do too. But just be aware of that bias when you're making your investment decisions because they, there's research that proves that companies perform better when they've got some senior leaders that are women. So um, Morgan Stanley did a recent survey and just for reference, women are also more interested in sustainable investing. They wanna get more than just returns on their money. Um, and so 84% of women want that, have that interest. And I know the majority of my investors do, we wanna make a difference with our money. Uh, men are more likely to be more interested in the return on investment as well. Now, what you're finding is that um, the inv gender lens investing is increasing dramatically. Nine times the amount of money was invested in uh, last June in gender lens mandated companies across 22 publicly traded products from 100 million in 2014. So organizations are getting more and more aware of using the gender lens as part of their investing decision. So if you care about this at all, if this is important to you, and I hope it is, please try to avoid the, the gender equity laggards, the ones that don't care about or aren't even aware of it or have an all male board or have an all male founding team. And they're not even considering the fact that they may wanna include some women. Um, try to seek out diverse leaders when you can. And I would hope that you would invest in companies that seek to elevate women and girls, companies like Purse Power. So just quickly, I'm gonna give you a high level background about Purse Power and I'll make it quick. Um, what happened again, we saw this gap between the representation of women in senior leadership positions and their economic power. And we thought, okay, what can we do to close that gap? And uh, what we wanna do again is reward the companies that support women with revenue. That's what we're trying to accomplish. Right now, there's no clear way to tell. If you were in a store or whatever, I, do you guys have daughters? I'm sure you have wives. You've got women in your life you care about. There's no clear way when you're going to the store and you're buying something right now to say, okay, which companies actively promote women? How can I choose to use my buying power to support these companies? Purse power is trying to create that way for you to know when you're making your buying decisions. And then in addition, just as a cause also, and part of this had to do with, we care about this, but also we thought that this might drive people to change their buying behavior. We do wanna support battered women's shelters in particular with a revenue stream coming out of purse power. So we created a national directory of over 750,000 women-owned and women-led businesses. Those are companies that have a female CEO or president or are half-owned by women or have at least 20% women on their board. So we're not being unreasonable. That bar is not a lie. What we want to do is become a source to find and buy from women-owned and women-led companies if people are interested in doing that. We created a web and mobile platform that enables shoppers to find them whether they're shopping online or they're shopping physically near, nearby to know which companies those are and which products those are. And again, we've, we've created this social cause as well. So uh, we did partner with Carnegie Mellon. Um, we've created this very large directory of women-owned and women-led businesses. We partnered with Carnegie Mellon to build a Google Chrome extension that goes on your Google Chrome browser. So as you're shopping, our logo appears next to the companies that are women-owned or women-led so that you can tell who you might wanna buy from. And then again, our apps will show you when you're physically near them on a map, we've got coupons they can do, and this is something that we're building out greater functionality around. And again, we're, we're Edmond-based, we're here in Oklahoma. These are some of our investors. I don't know if you guys can see the names, but Sue Ann Arnell, Martha Berger, uh, uh, names you might know, Jill Castilla, 
Denise Castelli, John Davis, I mentioned, Jackie Fiegel, um, Deborah Fleming, Jennifer Grigsby. I'm sure you know some of these names. Linda Hanneborg, um, Jennifer Love Meyer. Let's see here. Anybody else you'd want to know about? Jan Peary. So we've got women from across the US. The majority of our investors are here in Oklahoma. And when you talk about how we came to find these investors, I've had relationships with many of these people for years and we've done um, investment related events. And these folks are bringing in their colleagues because they wanna make a difference. They care about having an impact. Bottom line, these are women that wanna leave a legacy. That's who they are. And we're all here trying to make a difference for women. This Great. is our, uh, yeah, go ahead. Was there a question? All right, Donna, thanks very much for, uh, for your presentation. And I think we can all take something from that. And uh, I don't have daughters, but I have granddaughters. And I, I know they're growing up in a world where they're gonna have opportunities that, that uh, you know, uh, females of, of, of my uh, age bracket did not have. Um, next, we're gonna get over to Tarl Gamble. Uh, he's the SVP Laylock Band in California. Uh, Tarl, I know you're on there, but I don't think we can see you, but we can hear you. Are you there? Well, I'm not hearing Tarl come along. Um, let's uh, let's switch over and go to Ke uh, to uh, Kevin uh, Moore. Kevin, are you you're with us, right? Uh, yeah. You can can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. Kevin is the CFO of 3PL. Uh, an investment executive with over 25 years experience in the financial services industry. And you have uh, some keen insight in developing professional and personal relationships. Go ahead. Well, thanks, thanks. Uh, I don't have a presentation, so you're gonna just have to look at me. Um, actually, 20 years ago, I married a woman named Donna Miller. You did. <laughs> I, I did, I did, and she scares me. She's upstairs right now, but she, she's the one that's keeping me in the basement for a couple of weeks, right, since I came back from Oklahoma. Uh, being, <laughs> Being around Roshan and guys like Mick, I mean, she was got real concerned about who I was uh, hobnobbing with. But, but, uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I actually live in McLean, Virginia, but I've spent 20 years in Oklahoma, lived in Broken Arrow, and actually, you know, uh, spent most of my career 30 years in, in direct management experience in public and private companies. The most recent uh, 20 years I've spent as president of Manhattan Construction Company, uh, which is uh, based in Oklahoma, based in Tulsa. It's the oldest company in Oklahoma. Uh, you know, did the uh, did the Oklahoma State Capitol, the you know the arena downtown, the uh, you know Cowboy Stadium, a lot of big fun stuff, right? So so I was there for 20 years, and and uh, so I spent my career kind of driving, you know, shareholder value from the inside, right, from the operational side of the business. We, we grew that company from, you know, 100 million to where it was almost three billion dollars, right? So it's I think it's the second largest company, private company in the state of Oklahoma to Loves and. And uh, just a great company. And it's actually a woman-run company now. Uh, Rooney Holdings, uh, Francis Rooney's company is run by his daughter, uh, Kathleen. So uh, so there you go, right? So I've, I've got three daughters and five granddaughters. So I'm, I'm surrounded. Fantastic. Surrounded. Right? <laughs> I, got, I got two male dogs just to balance it out. But, but so... So for me, the experience of balancing out, like, uh, the, the work and financial lives of 3,000 employees... Uh, plus the you know, obtaining the maximum return from the shareholders was kind of that that was where I've got my experience. And so I, I left that in 2018. I started my own company, uh, EFM Integrated Solutions, which is a consulting company that that kind of helps people, you know, impart some of the some of the lessons I've learned in, in my career. I've done that to other companies in the U.S. and in Canada. Uh, it's been a lot of fun and you noted know, notably. Yeah, I'm into business simplification. I like simple stuff. I like engaging employees and then you know, looking forward rather than backwards, you know, so I spent, spent half my time doing that. And uh, then I also kind of went out to look for something, an opportunity that I could grow from the ground up and uh, had a lot of opportunities in, in, the re in renewable energy space, sustainable energy. Uh, we did a lot of solar work at Manhattan, uh, did some trash to energy plants and uh, went around looking for that and came across uh, a project, w which is how Roshan and I got to meet, but but I uh, found a project in Nevada with two smart geologists that is uh, maybe the largest find of rare earth metals in the world, right? So that's kind of what I'm working on right now. And <clears throat> when I was looking for this project, you know, I was kind of looking for a project, you know, in my mind, I had kind of five criteria. I kind of wanted, you know, I wanted a project 
where they perfected the science before they perfected how to raise the money, right? So, so you know, a lot of pro- a lot of projects in this industry that, that were in in this rare earth and, and uh, exploration industry, they uh, they think they have a fine, and then they go out and raise the money. They raise a ton of money, pay themselves mega salaries, and then they worry about the science. We're kind of going opposite. We're worrying about the science first, and uh, we're raising money as we need it, but we're not raising gobs of money. So. Second was a market that has a significant demand supply imbalance. Uh, we, you know, one of the one of the uh, major uh, items that we have in this find is lithium. We may have 15 million tons of lithium, which would be again maybe the largest find, it, definitely in North America, if not the world. Uh, you know, the the market for electric cars. You know, and, and you always hear about Tesla, but it's really the big three that are going to drive the demand for electric cars and lithium. Uh, we're going to have a significant supply demand imbalance when we're ready to come to market in 2022. And it's and for us, it was just a great time to hit the market. Uh, three, we wanted something that would protect the environment. Okay, we are not hard rock miners. We uh, found a lithium brine. I'll talk a little bit about the project in a minute, but we found a brine that is environmental, environmentally friendly. We, we extract what we need and we stick 88% of the water back into the earth, right? So again, uh, like you were talking about, Donna, something sustainable, right? Something that's, that's not, not going to you know, uh, adversely affect the environment. Uh, we've got owners, uh, the owners in this project, the two geologists that I met and the team we've assembled are completely aligned, right? Nobody works for salary. They're all working for their options, for their equity, right? So, so I think that the, the team and the owners are balanced with the shareholders that we do have, right? So, so it's been a good, and, and then fifth was we're not presupposing the outcome, right? We're not, you know, so I'm taking investor money and I'm not presupposing and telling my investors I'm going to go public in six months because I don't know if that's going to be the right decision or not. I mean, I, you know, it, it, we could, we could, you know, we could produce, we could go into production for ourselves and stay private. We can, we can actually uh, sell it. I mean, there's just a lot of different options. Going public is one of them, but we're not, we're not telling people, look, there's going to be a huge payday six months from now. Right. So, so they were the five things. And so the project itself is in a place called Railroad Valley, Nevada. It's, uh, you know, it's northern Nevada. It's, uh, there's about, I, I looked on, the, I, I did look at the election results in, in the county there. there. There were a total of 4,000 people that voted. So it's not a very populated place. It's near Area 51. And uh, back in 2016, you know, a geologist named Vince Ramirez uh, came up with a, a way using oil well logs to find brine. Okay. And it, nobody else had done it. Uh, he did it. There were 90 oil wells drilled in that area. We used the data from that. Uh, we raised some money. We went in and staked the land. We we drilled a well and actually found the brine and since have, have done seismic testing and metallurgic testing. And we believe we have 30 billion barrels of this stuff, 30 billion barrels of brine, uh, which would dwarf anything, certainly in North America. So, you know, in, in, in going about this, I think the right way, we're actually going to the next phase where we're going to drill six to eight wells. Uh, we've started that process in the fall, and then we'll get back into it in the spring once the rainy season ends uh, and get an independent report that will tell us exactly what's in the land. Okay, and then at that point, it'll also tell us the composition of the of, of what's there. So so uh, Roshan's gotten involved. To kind of, we, We've been raising friends and family money. I've, I've raised most of this money through business contacts, a lot of them in Oklahoma. First place I came to when I, when I wanted to raise money was the state of Oklahoma. Uh, since I had so many contacts there, and I met Roshan through a friend, uh, and Roshan since has come on board as our exclusive capital partner. So as we raise money for these next phases, I know he'd like to pump money in quicker. Sorry, buddy, but uh, but as as we raise money for these next phases, the the, the funds are going to come through Roshan and the cost of capital. So uh, I mean, if anybody wants any uh, any information on the project, I mean, I'd be happy to send you a deck and, and send you the information on it. Uh, we are purposely not. You know, we don't have a website. We haven't publicized this thing. Uh, we are raising money as we need it, and, and we'll, go, we'll go to press at the right time when we know exactly what we have. We're not going to sell something that we don't know. Uh, we, we believe we've de-risked this thing about 85% by, by drilling and finding it. Uh, we've got the metallurgic and seismic testing to match that. So we feel we de- de-risked it, but we want to be 100% confident in what we're selling. So so anyway, so it's uh, so that's kind of what the project is uh, sustainable, uh, just a, just a fun project to be involved in. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Roshan. Um, I'll just say thanks for the plug. <laughs> Always <laughs> great working with you, Kevin. Thank you so much for that. And it's a uh, very excited to be part of this project. I have never seen something with so much 
uh, potential and just really happy to be part of the team. Thank you. Kevin, you, you're, you're known for diversifying your um, assets across mm -hmm. a lot of different classes and different securities. Mm -hmm. Is rare and, and minerals, is that one of those classes that you feel like is underutilized uh, when people are starting to diversify? I, I think, I think, Nick, I think what, what happens is people, people will invest in the companies that promote, right? And I, I can tell you there's probably 450 companies out there that say they have some sort of rare earth metal finds. 440 of them are probably total bullshit, excuse me, so total, uh, total <laughs> crap. Right. So, I mean, so, you know, until you get in and, and see what's, see what's under the tires, a lot of these companies either don't have a find or have a find that they'll never be able to harvest because it's environmentally toxic. Right. I mean, to, to get some of this stuff out of the earth is uh, environmentally toxic. And even in a mining friendly state like Nevada, uh, they don't want people coming in and raping and pillaging their land. Right. So, so yeah, it is. It is. You know, I've done a lot of oil and gas with the Rooney. So we did a lot of oil and gas. We did a lot of real estate, and and yeah, this is a, this is a sector that that is I think is underrepresented in a lot of people's portfolios. All right. Any other questions for Kevin at this point from anybody else? All right. Let's uh, and we can come back if anyone has a question. But let's move forward with Gary Kloppenstein. Gary, I see your your smiling face on there. Gary is is a successful executive, more than 30 years of experience in asset management, strategic consulting and leadership development. His specific areas of expertise are the design and implementation of investment strategies across both traditional and alternative investment classes. That's a mouthful, Gary. It is a mouthful. I should rewrite that, <laughs> make it a little <laughs> bit more understandable. Uh, but thanks, and thanks uh, Rosha for having me here. It's, it's a real pleasure to meet all you. So I'm based in Chicago. Um, and uh, I, I thought what I could do is maybe give you kind of a quick background of mine that'll explain a little bit about what Nick just said, and then talk about a couple of things that we're doing uh, currently. So my background is in um, alternative investment management. I started my own firm back in the mid 80s doing quantitative analysis of liquid alternative markets, things like currencies and commodities, um, and some global macro. Here I'm having a little bit trouble hearing you. If you just speak a little louder, get a little closer to your computer. Or I don't know if there's a volume oh, Steve, control. Is this better? On. Is this better? Yeah, it is. Okay. It I is. just moved my microphone closer. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, I'll just back up and say what I said real quickly. So I've been in the investment management, alternative investment management business for about 35 years and got my start doing quantitative modeling around um, primarily liquid strategies and things like currencies and commodities, global macro, so forth. Built my own business uh, for about 17 years and then sold that with the purpose of joining another firm to develop the same thing on a bigger platform. Actually thought we had a better mousetrap, so to speak, and could compete with some of the bigger players out there. And bigger players out there were people like Goldman and State Street and JP Morgan and so forth that were in our space at the time. And um, it turned out that worked okay. Um, I built that business then with you know, on a larger platform. Um, to about a little bit over 50 billion in assets. And our clients were all over the world. There are uh, pension plans, insurance companies, family offices, endowments, foundations, and so forth. So real good access into the, um, the invested capital, the holders of capital uh, in those markets. And then I was, by that time, it was over about a 10 year period. Um, I was also overseeing all private equity, venture capital, hedge fund of funds, hedge funds, and real assets. Uh, investing and um, really enjoyed that a lot. I was on the board of the parent company, traveled a lot, was had clients all over the world. Um, and about six years ago, decided that I was working too hard and um, and decided to sell my ownership that I own, the shares that I own to my partners in that business and retired. My wife tells me not to ever tell anybody I'm retired, but um, because I work probably as hard now as I, as I did then, but essentially set up a single family office. So basically the context is you probably all know what a single family office is, but managing the wealth of our family for, you know, kind of generational legacy. And so um, I'm the first generation of that. And I have both of my children and my daughter-in-law work for me and some other broader staff as well. And what we do now is, is really invest primarily in privately held companies. So we like coming into a small company, often relatively early stage and bring several things to the table. One is obviously capital, Two is um, the little bit of the of experience that I have in terms of going from a small business up to a 50 billion plus business over time. Um, so scaling, 
governance. You know, there's so many important things to know when you're starting a business or just in the early first few years. Um, decisions that you need to make that are actually going to have really big impacts when you're a few years down the road. You know, are you going to sell into an industry partner? Are you going to go public? Or are you just going to maintain a, a business the way that it is uh, as an income generator or so forth? So how do you think about that? And then just the culture that we carry. Um, you know, you talk about the family office side of things tends to be more permanent capital. Um, so we don't have, we're very different than say a venture capital fund uh, or something like that. We really think about this as long-term capital investment um, and how do we really change things and do things that are very transformative to the areas that we're investing in. So that's kind of the broad sense of or picture of what we do. It's a relatively limited portfolio. I normally sit on the board of the company or have one of my representatives sit on the board. My children um, will shadow me and now they're starting to do board positions as well, which has been, has been great. Our average return on investment is uh, somewhere above 40% a year um, on the investments that we do. So it's been a relatively successful model. Um, and um, one of the interesting things we're doing now, so kind of where we play in the space is we're bigger than a typical high net worth uh, by quite a bit, but we're not as big as somebody like a Carlisle or a Goldman. And what we find is actually it's a perfect place to be because there's things that are too small for the big guys to go after. And there's things that are too big for the smaller players to go after. And with my experience in the alternative investment management industry, I really don't need a lot of additional help to figure out, is this going to be a good you know, underlying investment um, to get into? So I've got that piece of it, I think, fairly well in hand. So a couple of things we're investing in now one that I really like and love the rare earth thing, uh, Kevin, by the way, we should talk about that sometime as well, is um, is we like to come in is where, where can what we bring make a real difference? And we're finding that right now is one of the opportunities is there's a company out of Australia called Innovise um, that basically does commercialization of hard technology. So in the area of advanced materials, advanced manufacturing, circular economy, uh, various things um, around the, in that area. And um, we're basically bringing our platform to the US. I'm a owner of that company. And our, our family office is an owner of that company. And what we do is search for really transformative technology coming out of universities and um, national research labs and do that in the area of hard technology. So you see tons of this done, accelerators and so forth in call it, uh, you know, soft tech, software, things like that. But when you get into hard tech and engineering, it, it's a longer road. There's this place called the Valley of Death where you find a good innovation and then there's nothing that really comes out of it for a number of years. And we actually specialize or Innovise specializes, <coughs> excuse me, in that space. And so what we do is we come in, we find great technology and we build a team of people around it as opposed to asking some professor at the university to be the CEO. Um, we actually bring in our own people and build the teams around that. We partner with um, large organizations to say, you know, does this work for you? Is this a technology that you like? And would you like to sit on our board or would you like to sit on and be an advisor to the companies? And we look to innovate on somewhere between six and 10, uh, just radically transformative innovations every year. Um, one of the areas we're interested in is rare earth. Um, and, and that, so again, we should, we should talk about that. And we don't do much on the mining side, so to speak, but I, I would suspect that we have some overlap in areas around uh, um, some of the technologies we're looking at in rare earth, especially out of some of the national labs. Awesome. Here, your, rate, your rate of return is extraordinary. How do you teach your children about risk and uh, the type of investments that they should be looking at for long term? Um, it's pretty non-traditional. Um, you know, it's, again, I don't want me to be offending anybody of my views here, but I just kind of throw portfolio management out the window um, because I'm not going to have the kinds of returns and actually have the impact I want on the world to come if I put X percent of my portfolio in equities and X percent in fixed income and so forth. So I teach them how to understand people and how to understand opportunity. And we only do things that we think we have a very high percentage probability of success. So as an example, our Australian partners at Innovise, um, they're about 75% um, correct on the technologies that they onboard. And they've, um, they've commercialized over 70 innovations in the last six years. Three of them have gone public. There'll be three more going public in the coming 18 months. Um, so it's really understanding when to say no is probably the best thing and mm -hmm. um, understanding where we fit and where we don't fit and then just do the things where we fit. Yeah. And, and how hands-on do you want to be after you've invested, how hands-on do you expect to be or want to be with the, with the CEO or the entrepreneur? 
Well, in, in the in my broad portfolio, because Innovise is one of the companies in the portfolio. So, did you mean with Innovise or with the with the broad? Oh, with the private companies that you choose to invest. Um, it depends on the company. Um, I, we want to do what it is that really makes those companies thrive, and sometimes that's the CEO just needing someone to come alongside him and give him some guidance and help him. Sometimes it's help him to you know let go when he's holding on too hard. Sometimes it's helping to find the right person and put him in the right chair. Um, sometimes it's having him move to a different spot, but sometimes it's just being an advisor. So it really varies. I mean, one of the companies, you know, during the COVID crisis, we moved from a quarterly management meeting to um, a weekly management meeting. And the company um, this year is up 10X in value, um, not just because we moved to the, the meeting, but there was, it was, you have to put the time and energy into that um, and do that. So I'm on that board and my son is an advisor um, into that company. And it's been, it's been really well. There's other ones that I'll sit on a quarterly management call and do very little. Uh, because they have the ability, they don't really need the skills I bring. Maybe the capital is more important in that situation. So it really depends I, on. I you know. just have to pull the plug and say, you know, I thought this was going to be a good deal, but I, I've changed my mind. There are. Fortunately, in our portfolio, there's been very few of those. Um, but there are some times when you don't, and then, you know, it's a, the challenge is how do you, how do you end something well? Because it's one of our, again, the culture things we bring, I think, as a family office is honor and respect to people because they're actually more important at the end of the day than the business and making money. And so how do we do something where we can effectively, you know, wind something down and still do that in a way that is respectful and honoring and puts people in the right spot. But yeah, sometimes hard decisions need to be made, obviously. I'm sure everybody on the call knows that. Yeah. Uh, questions for Gary from anyone. All right. Gary, thanks for your participation. And there may be questions later, so I hope you'll stay with us. Great. Thank you. I'm next going to introduce Robert Miller. He's the CEO of Sky Dweller Aero. He's an experienced aerospace executive with a history of successfully executing one-of-a-kind projects, prototypes, and development programs from clean sheet design through flight test. He has experience in developing and executing business strategies in aerospace and vendors. Robert Miller, where do you fall in, in that broad aviation category? Oh, that's a <laughs> well, Sky, what we're trying to do at Sky Dweller is we're trying to um, develop the world's first commercially viable pseudo satellite. Okay, so let me uh, show some charts here. Hold on. Um, let me share this. Okay. New, uh, who's ever allowing the sharing? There we go. We just made you a host, Robert. Okay, no problem. Okay, so this is a picture of Skydweller. It's it's a large solar powered aircraft. Um, it's based on the, the solar impulse aircraft that flew around the world. So I, my co-founder and I had the opportunity to negotiate with the guys who founded the Solar Impulse Project, which they built, they spent, they raised and spent about $200 million over 14 years to build the first, the world's first real solar powered aircraft. And then they flew it around the world. And then once they did that, they were trying to figure out what to do with it. And my partner, and I convinced them that they weren't really well positioned to sell it into the aerospace defense business, which is the kind of entry point with most aerospace products. And we raised uh, a little over 20 million to get going and we're still filling out our series A. Um, and we purchased the aircraft and all the intellectual property associated with it. Um, and it's been, uh, so far it's been a, a good experience. We have a launch customer um, in the U.S. government, and we are uh, in the process of converting it to a drone. Um, it's uh, a new experience for me in that uh, for the first time, we're, this is really an international company. I'm actually in Madrid, Spain right now, um, and we launched the company first in Europe because the aircraft was built and designed in Europe, so we wanted to capture the intellectual property that's in some of the engineers' heads here and the supply chain before we move it back to the United States. Um, or we moved, uh, we, we established also a production facility there. So we'll probably have two production facilities in the long run. Um, and it's a big aircraft. 
So it's the wingspan of a 747, but weighs less than a F-150 pickup truck. So it's, uh, and uh, we just moved the world headquarters to Oklahoma. Um, and we're gonna go after basically two big market verticals, which is the government surveillance business and then the broadband communication business. If you think about this as a, a pseudo satellite, this aircraft, um, like satellites, started mostly at first with all the U.S. government and the national security infrastructure funding development of these, maturing the technology. And then over time, that technology became uh, mature enough such that people started to do commercially, such that now almost all the communication satellites that get launched are commercial communication satellites the government buys time, you know, like you buy, uh, you know, your cell phone time. And then, you know, you're now you're also starting to see people launching uh, observation satellites. Well, they've been doing it for, uh, you know, almost 20 years now and selling that data, I'll call it commodity data to the US government. And so we think there's an opportunity here for us um, in the government surveillance market where we have some unique capability and in the broadband communications market, once that we fully mature the technology on the government surveillance market kind of dime and move into production because of that. So, um, and I've been in the drone business for 30 plus years, um, grew up in Oklahoma and it's, uh, it's a good, good time to be coming back. It's uh, Oklahoma's changed a lot. Uh, you know, Mayor Cornette, you did a great job in Oklahoma city. You know, it's like when we spoke at dinner, when, when I left, there was the Oklahoma City Blazers. When now coming back, there's the Oklahoma City Thunder. It's it's, it's not a little upgrade. Yeah, um, changed a lot. So, um, and and there's a lot of, of talent there that we're gonna that that is now there that we can leverage to 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 build this up. So, I don't want to. I mean, from an investor side, it's, it's been also an educational experience. This time, this is the first time I've really gone out and and raised a a large amount of money. Um, I mean, our Series A is is we're going to oversubscribe it from we're going from 32 to 40 million. So it's 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 a very large uh, Series A, um, and uh, it's and it and it is a different type of, of business plan than most of the VCs. I went up and down Sand Hill Road in San Francisco, um, and I went to Stanford as an undergrad, so I know a lot of people. I know a lot of partners in those firms and everything. And it just this was this was more of an M and A deal for them than a than a typical uh, investment thing. Where you can kind of think of it as the guys who first did this, they didn't they didn't really understand what they were doing. I mean, they, they were adventurers and stuff like that. The, the guy who started this project, his grandfather went to the stratosphere in a balloon. His father was the first guy to go to the Marianas Trench in a submarine. And he was the first guy to go around the world in a balloon, in a Breitling balloon in 2000. So, you know, he's, he's an adrenaline junkie and they did this all on marketing. And he got together with another guy uh, in Switzerland and they, they did all this. And when they got done, they had this asset. It's kind of like a piece of property. Say you had a piece of property in downtown Oklahoma City or downtown Chicago, and it was zoned for, um, you know, farming. And these guys couldn't figure out how to get it rezoned. So some experienced guys in the aerospace defense industry came in. We're going to buy this piece of property. We're going to get it rezoned for commercial real estate and build a skyscraper on it and sell it. And that, that's basically what we're doing. So, and uh, it's, just an, it's, it's an interesting thing to, to, to understand how the, the kind of the larger investors view aerospace defense you, you know, how they make investments, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's been a, an educational experience for me. So. Mm -hmm. Robert, you mentioned government surveillance and broadband communications. Which of those market sectors is probably the largest for you to pursue? Well, long-term broadband communications is, is, is huge. Okay. I mean, that's bigger than the government surveillance market because you're, you're just servicing all these commercial customers you know, around the world. I mean, the government surveillance market, what it offers is it offers the investors kind of a, we, we know this market 
is well defined. We know the requirements are well defined. We know the capabilities we bring are we differentiate us from other parts of the market. So we can go capture that and we can we can get a good return just on that. But at the same time, then there's this upside that's available that's, that's, that's a little hard to quantify, but we know it's huge that when we mature the technology under the government's nickel um, and doing a mission for them, that in the end, when we come out the other side, we're gonna have something that's, that's worth a huge amount of money. So. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Robert? Robert, if you want to put your camera back on, I, I'm okay. still seeing your slides. Okay, let me. Uh... There so we how, go. Long you, how long have you been in Madrid, Robert? A little over a year. Came okay. here last. In August, the kids started American school. So. Okay. Robert, is there airspace that's off limits to your aircraft um, through uh, international uh, treaties or expectations? We are in the process of working with the Spanish uh, Civilian Air Authority now and also like their military airworthiness people. They're, that's, that's another reason the commercial communications could take maybe a, you know, a little bit longer to mature in that all the regulations for operating unmanned aircraft of this kind of size in civilian airspace, they're not completely defined everywhere around the world. There's no universal agreement on this stuff. Um, and so, yes, there are some places that are, that are, we're not allowed to fly right now, but we can get permission a lot of the time to fly there, but it's kind of on a use case basis. It's not just a free for all. So. All right. Any other comments or questions for Robert? I have one question. Yeah. Is uh, the technology limited to sunny days? Yeah, I mean, you need sun. So it doesn't operate in Denmark in the, in the winter, OK? Um, but the way they fly is we'll fly up to about, during the day, we can get to 40, 45,000 feet. So we'll be above the clouds. So you know, in the morning, you climb up. Then at night, basically, you turn off the engines and you coast down to a lower altitude. You turn on the engines and that coast down is using basically a zero weight battery because you're putting the energy during the day into two things. You're putting it into the batteries and you're also putting it into altitude as potential energy. So. All right, Robert. And then what's, the, what, what's the top speed? We cruise about 25 knots at sea level. So up at uh, altitude, you're about 50 knots. So. It's fascinating. Robert, thanks. And, and stick around. There may be some more questions. And uh, sure. Carl, thank you for the question. And now let's hear from you, the Senior Vice President at Blaylock Van in Oakland, California. For the last 10 years, you've been specializing in corporate finance coverage of Fortune 500 companies that focus on soliciting and winning underwriting mandates for debt and equity offerings. Thanks for joining us. We'll make, I guess, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, you know, I work for a, a, a firm, uh, you know, headquartered in Oakland, California. We're a regional investment bank broker dealer. Uh, and we do debt equity underwriting, share repurchase, you know, pension trading. Um, we compete against, you know, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, Citibank, you know, firms like that, as well as, you know, smaller, you know, uh, regional firms. Um, uh, we do a lot of work with the Fortune 500 uh, in terms of, uh, you know, underwriting their bonds or, or uh, stock and rivals. Um, and, uh, you know, that's sort of, that's just, that's our, you know, our, our business. We get in, um, we try to be the co-manager of choice. We're not uh, big enough to, to lead anything. We don't offer any credit, um, you know, to help companies, uh, you know, in between, uh, you know, so the fundraising, you know, major fundraising events, right? Um, but we offer, 
uh, you know, sort of a lot of information regarding, uh, you know, sort of investor demand, uh, market positioning, uh, interest rates, direction, um, you know, things that, uh, you know, may not be, uh, you know, sort of conveyed, um, you know, in between uh, transactions. Um, it's my day job, uh, you know, on, uh, you know, for a volunteer basis, I, I'm a trustee and vice chair for the Alameda County Employees Retirement uh, Association. Uh, it's a small little retirement fund. It's about $9 billion. Um, you know, when we invest, uh, you know, in every, every, uh, every investment vertical, whether or not that's uh, equity, fixed income, alternative investments, real estate, uh, uh, real assets, you know, mining, timber, um, farmland, et cetera. Is your level of risk in a, in a retirement portfolio like that lower than it might be in another investment? Well, I would say it's lower than it would be in an endowment, right? Um, but not lower than any other uh, investment strategy, right? I mean, we have, uh, you know, sort of a, 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 a hurdle, right? A benchmark hurdle that uh, we, we try to achieve every year um, and design uh, and try to position the fund Right to beat that hurdle, and our current hurdle is uh, you know six and a quarter percent. Okay, and are are there any emerging markets that you're specifically interested in? Are you are you looking for for new things to come to your on your uh, portfolio? Absolutely, definitely interested in uh, you know India, Asia, and Africa. Right, uh, we got about two hundred eighty million uh, deployed to Africa. Uh, almost none deployed to India. Uh, we got about 350 deployed to Latin America uh, and, you know, somewhere between 75 to 100 uh, to China. Mm -hmm. Why the high interest in those, in those countries? Return, opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> right, I mean, uh, you know, in essence, you know, a, a fund our size, uh, you know, we listen to a lot of, uh, you know, sort of manager pitches, right? And, you know, the smart guys come in and say, hey, you know, we can get you, you know, mid-teens return, uh, you know, for two, and, for two and 20, right? And, you know, we have, you know, all the connections in, you know, China, we, you know, we know all the China VCs and all the, you know, China real estate partners or all the, uh, you know, sort of African infrastructure funds or European, uh, you know, infrastructure funds. And, you know, we take a look and say, hey, we, we, we believe that you have the ability to execute, right? Uh, and, you know, there's a, you know, level of safety that, you know, if at the end of the day, we don't get any return uh, on the capital, we would, we would get a return of the capital. Mm -hmm. Any questions for Tarl? Makes a lot of sense. Hmm. So you said you said nine billion. Is that what you said? Yeah, nine billion. Oh, just a little bit of money. Okay. It's it's a small amount. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you you have uh, you know, forty miles from us, you have Calpers and Cal Stirs, which is the number one and the number yeah. three mm -hmm. uh, pension funds in the in the country. So. Uh, you know, and that they, they clock up together at about 750 billion, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, our nine billion is pretty, pretty small. Yeah. You know, the, a lot of uh, cities and states in the United States are looking for vast sums of money to from private sector to invest in infrastructure. Um, and is, is that something you've ever looked at? Is there, is there, uh, is there any, anything to that, that pitch um, for, for turnpikes or for future infrastructure that, that might help states or cities uh, accumulate the type of money they need to invest in themselves? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'd say, you know, one of the more recent investments we did was uh, in a Brookfield infrastructure fund, right? And Brookfield is a you know, large, uh, you know, alternative asset manager headquartered in Boston. Um, you know, and they, they, you know, mainly buy a lot of, uh, you know, sort of toll roads, Mm -hmm. or um, uh, sort of uh, shipping ports, um, you know, rail, rail, uh, rail lines, 
uh, and then you know some other uh, infrastructure, you know, containers, container ships, uh, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the you know what's missing in uh, you know I would sort of call normal you know bread and butter infrastructure in the U.S is you know a way to return right uh you know capital most infrastructure in cities and counties have always been uh financed via municipal bonds mm -hmm. right uh you know so you know u.s former mayor you know you have an understanding of you know you know municipal bonds and you know you know taxing the taxpayers for the, the use of of uh you know sort of the services that the, the city had built um but it, you know, those items don't, not, don't normally go to uh, private ownership. Right. All right. Um, well, and, and but there are yeah. some cities and states that just don't have access to capital. Some that do, and some that don't. And you know, that's where private uh, sector money could make a difference. Yeah, I mean, the key, I, I, and, but the, speaking from experience in, in that industry, we built these things. I mean, it's. I mean, it all depends on the risk you're taking, right? It, it's. Uh, I mean, a lot of these things, like in Texas and Austin, some of these places, they just, they just blown up on the people that have owned them, you know, yeah. just because they took an inordinate amount of risk, whether it's traffic risk or, or something else, you know, it's, it's, so it, it's been, it's been a tough go in the U S with roads, at least. I mean, I think the containers we invested in shipping containers and all that, that was great business. Uh, but the roads and everything has been a, it's been a tough go in the U S. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this, the assumption is that people will be willing to save, uh, you know, 10 or 20 minutes a day on the road by spending, you know, $6, you know, each way, mm -hmm. right? Uh, in reality, is I think people, you know, you know, in, in, in cities outside of the Bay Area, right, <laughs> are, are, are a little more fru frugal, right, <laughs> in terms of where, you know, where they're willing to spend their dollars. In the Bay Area, I mean, almost every freeway has now a toll roll on it. Right. And either you compete by paying six dollars each way or you own a Tesla. Right. Which uh, gives you a three year sticker to allow you to to to, to ride in that uh, in that lane for for a free for a portion of a time for free. All right. Well, Tarl, thank you. Stick around. We may have some more questions for you. Um, let's go to Brock Reed now, the CEO of Aviva Medical. Um, he's been involved in biotech investments and uh, sees the medical challenges and clinical need for, for kidney repair. Brock, can you join us? Yeah, and, and thank you very much for having me um, all the way all the way from Boston, or I guess Madrid gets the prize for the long distance <laughs> travel here. But since he's developing his own airplanes, he doesn't get credit for that. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm CEO of Aviva Medical, which is a startup company in the organ repair space. Um, and I'm also, uh, for the past 15 years, I've been the executive director of the Stem Cell Institute at Harvard. Um, and so let me just give you a little context first on regenerative medicine and the environment out of which Aviva comes and say sort of why I think it's now the time to build a company like that. Um, you know, people have heard about stem cells for, you know, for 15, 20 years now, but I just remind you that the field has really accelerated in the last five plus years with, um, you know, uh, developments such uh, that have enabled us really to understand how to wire and how to program cells. That shows up in a few different ways. One is the Nobel Prize that was won in 2012 by a pair of scientists who showed how you could take a, a mature cell, turn it into an earlier state, and then reprogram it. And the other was the, um, the Nobel uh, this year to Jennifer Dowden and Emmanuel Charpentier uh, for CRISPR, for gene editing. Um, and um, you should talk to them about purse power, Donna. But, the, uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, so now we have a quick, effective, relatively cheap way to put genes in and out of cells and can combine that with how to tell cells what to do. So what we're doing is developing control over cell fate. What that then lets us do 
is uh, develop a path for curative therapies for when things go wrong in the body, when you lose capability, um, injury, disease, et cetera. So far, pharmaceuticals mostly deal with symptoms, symptomatic treatment. The promise of regenerative medicine and stem cells, gene therapy, biomaterials, et cetera, are actually to develop curative therapies. Um, and stem cell science has a bunch of spin-offs. If some of you may say, well, it's just, you know, wacky early stage science, I'd point out that um, several years ago in the, uh, in the immuno-oncology and the cancer space, several companies like Juno, Kite, et cetera, became billion dollar companies in what's known as the CAR T space. These are engineered T cells you take out of someone, an engineered blood cell, fix it, put it back into the body and cure someone of their leukemia, for example, a curative therapy. Um, there are now cell therapies in, you know, that are in the clinic for uh, eye repair, both for cornea and retina. There's uh, cell therapies uh, in the clinic for diabetes, for Parkinson's disease, gene edited stem cells for sickle cell anemia, et cetera. And the technology also has spinoffs. For example, a decade ago, we funded a project you're looking at using messenger RNA to reprogram a cell. Um, and then that project work, we then realized, wait a minute, that can be a way of delivering therapeutics. And then they realized, wait a minute, that can be delivering vaccines. That project became the IP basis for what's now Moderna, which many of you hear about as sort of in the whole COVID vaccine race. So stem cell science and these tools have all sorts of downstream uh, effects as well. So the next stage of development is not only saying, how do you fix individual cells? Like when, you know, in diabetes, you know, the disease crashes down on an islet cell, but how do you repair an organ? A complex combination of cells in a complex architecture. Mm -hmm. so Iviva Medical was started by a colleague of mine at Mass General Hospital. And um, a couple of years ago, we did a seed round and we're doing another seed round right now to uh, take the company to the next stage of developing essentially a kidney replacement. So it's a combination of thin film biomaterials where you print channels on either side, which then you can then load with what I call cells of interest. In other words, you can put blood cell on one side and kidney cells on the other. So you can essentially replace the filtering and the reabsorption function of the kidney. Oh. And you stack them up. And you, know, you put it all together and then you can have eventually a human scale device to replace the need for transplant or dialysis. Why is that a problem? It's because so far, I mean, dialysis hasn't changed over the last 50 years. It really hasn't. Um, and it's a miserable quality of life and transplants don't solve the kidney transplant problem. In the US, there are you know, half a million people uh, on dialysis a year. There are 100,000 people on the kidney transplant wait list and only 20,000 get them each year. Uh, you know, so just huge demand and total uh, huge unmet medical need. Um, so the promise of this technique, if it works, is that you can essentially get someone off dialysis and ultimately have a replacement for a transplant and without requiring a pump, without requiring dialysate and essentially um, providing essentially native function. In all honesty, it won't provide 100% of function, but the kidney is a redundant organ. And all you need, obviously, you all know you start with two, but you only need one to survive. Mm -hmm. And even in any single kidney, if you get about 15%, 12, 15% of function, you can get off dialysis. So it's unlike someone with a heart. If you give someone a new heart, you need 100% function so it doesn't electrically misfire, that sort of thing. So there is you know, a margin. We don't have to have the perfect natural replacement. And the other thing, and the reason we need to do this combination of techniques with stem cell science, biomaterials, and 3D printing is because the kidney, you can't grow a kidney by itself. It's too complex an architecture. A liver has a stem cell, certain organ, you know, simple organs have, some, or the pancreas is made up of these beta islet cells. You can grow those cells, but the kidney is a very complex structure architecturally as well as uh, biologically. And so this sort of combination of you know, biological engineering um, uh, takes advantage of some of these new tools. And that's why we think now is the time to do that. It's also an interesting platform technology 
Um, we, for example, in this you know, era of COVID, people are wondering, you know, how does the virus act, et cetera? I mentioned that in the kidney example, we look at blood cells on one side and kidneys on the other, this membrane and these channels. You can do the same thing, put air on one side and blood on the other to replicate lung function. So right now we're in a project um, funded by a foundation to look at um, putting lung cells on one side, airway epithelial cell, blood on the other, and see not only can we model gas exchange, but what happens when you introduce a virus and what happens when you don't. And, and when you introduce the virus and then what happens, and then you can think of, you know, introducing a pharmaceutical or vaccine to say, how can you cure it? So essentially a 3D model of a lung to understand how the disease happens, but also what a potential you know, therapeutic intervention would look like. When uh, you're preparing this kidney, mm -hmm. my ignorance on the subject, is it still inside the, the subject's body or is it outside the body when it's being repaired? There, there'll be, uh, no, that, that's a good question. And there'll be two steps. So the idea is first to do the outside the body, the extracorporeal, if you want to sound fancy about it. Um, so that, that way you don't have to you know, deal with um, because that'll be a lower regulatory hurdle from the FDA perspective, because you don't have to prove it'll be, you know, fine inside the body for X period of time. So the idea is we go to go to the clinic would be you first do an extracorporeal version and then you do an implant version. Hmm. Much like you do a kidney implant today and just hook it up to the blood supply and the, and the urinary supply. And where we are so far, so our first seed round we showed we could have very simple device, a two-layer device that we hooked up to a, um, a pig model and said that it showed that it could perfuse and create a filtrate. The, the outcome of this next round is to go from a two-layer to a 10-layer device that we would fully functionally test in vitro and also in large animals. And the pig would be the animal of, of choice. And to have enough data to go to the FDA to say, what would a clinical trial look like? And then, and then, and then, for humans, we probably need to scale that device from ten layers to probably thirty layers. And so, you're still several mm -hmm. stages away. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah, impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's you know it's somewhat different from what you know what we talked about this afternoon, mm -hmm. but um, you know, but this is a problem that you know just hasn't been able to be addressed by, you know, uh, solutions so far. And mechanical devices, you know, um, are bound to foul, you know, synthetic membranes foul. So we think that the combination of the scientific know-how from stem cell science, knowledge of cell populations, knowledge of biocompatible materials, uh, now is the time to combine all those into a, into a solution set. So do you think, you think they're going to be able to grow like any organ in the body? To replace eventually? No, um, because I mean, for example, this organ, I said you you hook it up to a blood supply in the ear, but it doesn't have to uh, be electrically conductive like the heart, right? So you couldn't use this technology to recreate a heart. Okay. Um, but you could create what they call epithelial, or so you could, for example, use this approach for the intestine. You could use it for the pancreas. Uh, we have a, a project funded for um, uh, by Di Diabetes Foundation uh, applying this to the pancreas because you need to have blood supply to your islets and your pancreas. Mm -hmm. Or you could imagine uh, lung, although the lung also has a physical movement too. What about like an eye? Um, no, but you don't need it for the eye um, because the, the eye right now, for example, in retinal cell therapy, if you lose sight, you know, like macular degeneration, that sort of thing, yeah. people are putting cells on a thin membrane uh, and the blood supply there, you know, vascularizes really quickly and it's really thin. So it doesn't have the same scale problem. So what we're trying to do with this technology is solve large organ problems okay. like, like the pancreas, whereas the eye, you don't need that as a solution. You can put either individual cells without a biomaterial or cells on a scaffold, but a very thin scaffold. So you don't need the same level of complexity. Prof, does it take a pretty specific and specialized investor to, to want to be involved in your project or is it, is it more broad-based audience? 
I think it's broad based and motion can comment as well. Um, the, I mean, it does take specific investors who can look at the risk, et cetera, but it also takes people who are interested in impact um, in the sense, um, you know, in, uh, of, you know, having an impact on a major disease that can't otherwise be cured. Mm -hmm. um, so impact investors are very interested in, you know, companies like this and others because they say, you know, wait a minute, you can have, um, you know, we're, motiv we're motivated by the disease and the condition. And if you can solve it or help move the needle to solving it, you could, you know, they're not only they're huge financial returns, but also, um, you know, health economic returns as well as, you know, psychosocial returns. Mm -hmm. What is the add to Brock's point, um, you know, VC biotech has become an important asset class in and of itself. It's an important uh, sector of technology that gives investors uh, exposure to a lot of things they might not have trouble with um, prior. But, but groups uh, like Brock's and the Harvard Stem Cell Institute do a lot of the hard work by incubating these companies, working with them, mentoring them, and before they take investment onto that stage. So Brock has been a leader in this regenerative medicines uh, sector for over 15 years now and has really developed it. So thanks for all your work, making our job much easier. I'm not sure we take all the risks, but we can de-risk some of it. <laughs> well, Brock, at the end of the day, when you're successful, is, is, is it, is, will doctors be trained in, in this procedure or is, is there, will there be a series of clinics across the country that can offer this service? How, how do you perceive that, that? That's a great question because many, many medical devices have failed because people never thought about how does the surgeon actually, you know, who's, who's the customer? How does the surgeon actually deal with this thing, right? Um, in this case, actually our founding uh, scientist and CSO, chief scientific officer is a surgeon at Mass General and we do have a surgeon on our SIB as well, who's head of transplant at Mass General, our scientific advisory board, sorry. Um, and so the idea is you now you'd fo follow the exact same procedure as you would do for a kidney transplant. So any, any transplant surgeon who's doing kidney transplants would know what to do. Okay. That's, that's the idea. Brock, thanks very much. Any, any questions for Brock before we let him go? All right, Roshan, we've uh, we've gone through our, our guest. I can't tell you how fascinating this was. The level of content in the last hour has been amazing. It sure has. And thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Mick, uh, for being our moderator with such great questions, especially with Brock and, and the science, the high level of science they're doing. I'm glad you're asking the questions. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> Well, um, Roshan, obviously this was a, I think this was a big success when you're able to exchange ideas and connect people. And, and I suspect there will, there will be some, some, some public good uh, that comes out of these conversations that I've had uh, tomorrow or next week or, or maybe a few years from now. So thanks for connecting all of us. Uh, thank you to all. If anyone that leads to connect with anyone, please, we'd be happy to assist. All right. Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to wrap up and uh, thank you all for, for sharing your time on this uh, Tuesday afternoon. And, and Roshan, thanks for putting this together. And, and of course, each of you has uh, Roshan's contact information. I'm sure he'd be glad to share any of our uh, content today. And this has been recorded and uh, hopefully it'll be available too. Roshan, thanks very much. And I'll thank our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. you thanks, Roshan, any final comments? Good. All right. Thanks again, everybody. I'll see you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.